Agape means love in Greek, and uh, the Greeks had four kinds of love. They had um, agape, which is the highest form of love. It's called the unconditional love, brotherly love. Actually, it's quoted in the Oxford Dictionary as the love that God has for man, love with no conditions. And eros was the erotic love uh, between the sexes, and it would be the, the love that is a little more basic. <laughs> and uh, philia, uh, which is the term for friendship, and charity, which is uh, charity, which is more of a universal love, doing good for others. That's wonderful. That's I amazing. Think we, we need a little bit of all of them. We do. A little bit of all of them. Right. Well, you are, you are talking about the mysterious lives of the women, the, the goddesses. Right. And mm. I'd like to know how you got into that. I mean, by Greek, by being a Greek, you yes, must have been. Of course, mission. I was raised with them all around me. You know, from school, from looking at them from my bedroom window, from the Parthenon, mm -hmm. we lived very close, and there they were, staring at me every day. Uh, and I learned from the school, but it was much later, Carol, when I came to the United States, that I, my sister, was writing a book about the gods and goddesses of Greece. And I got very involved in uh, their more esoteric ways and their archetypes, what they really represent. And they became much more alive in me, and I realized they were much more alive everywhere I looked. And of course, Carl Jung, the psychologist, talked a lot about the archetypes. And then when I was in drama school in London, because from Greece I went to London, I studied drama. When I was doing plays and when I was rehearsing and I would do different kinds of plays from Chekhov to the Greeks uh, to Shakespeare, I realized that these characters, these different kinds of women, were actually these archetypes and different women in the plays manifested different qualities just like the Greek goddesses. So between my Greek background, the theater background, and the psychology, it kind of all came together in this evening that I do, talking about the different goddesses, but really how they relate within ourselves. Well, that's fascinating. You're writing a book called Living the Goddess, mm -hmm. Seven Principles Embracing Female Consciousness. That's right. And um, that's exactly what that's going to be about. It's going to be about really empowering women in realizing that these different aspects, these different goddesses, are part of ourselves. And we all have them. It's just like, if you imagine like a big spectrum, and each one is a part of the pie, and until we give them voice, until each one of them becomes a reality within our own consciousness, within our own psyche, we're really not quite feeling all the way there. It's almost like a part of us might be a little dormant, a little bit asleep. And it doesn't mean that women have to go act out every part, but just to be aware that all parts are there. So you're saying maybe that this is subconscious and you're trying to make it more conscious. More conscious, exactly. And be more, in that way, if we're more conscious of them, then we're more empowered. Yeah, it's amazing that culturally we still have a long way to go for women to become more of equal partners with men. But I, I always look at it, Carol, that I, I don't look at it as uh, fighting with men or being one up or I think if we as women empower ourselves in who we are, we will take the steps necessary and it's almost men will have to give us the right to become who we are because it's more like a statement, making a statement of who you are, then you're not fought because you're stating it, you're affirming it. If you're fighting for it, and I think Women's Liberation did that, but I think we're at a new stage, and the new stage is affirming it, stating it, and then by, the, by your right, I think we will find that we will start collectively, we'll start changing the way men and society is um, for us. But we have to constantly stating, state our boundaries. Do women resist parts of themselves because they're threatening to either men or other people? Um, or do you need all pieces of these archetypes to be a whole person? I think it depends uh, on, again, what is the main point of exp what it is that we want to express. And I think a lot of times women who are out there in the world fighting in a man's world or uh, being part of a man's world, that would be more like the Athena types, let's say, uh, might find for themselves 
that they might be cutting off a part of them in order to function in that world. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you are going to function uh, as, a politi as a politician and be a woman, I I as a career woman, uh, not necessarily, I mean, we're not talking all the way around because there are definitely exceptions that uh, definitely there are a lot of women who can have manifested being both feminine and being excellent in a man's world. So it's not being masculine, it's being the more, um, more like the Greek goddesses and having all those aspects of yourself. Yes, I mean, but if you look at Donna Karan, um, Ira, Ira von Fischerberg, I mean, women who have just totally excelled. There's so many women, as the Lauder, who've excelled. But what world have they excelled? The world of making, it's really not in the world of Aphrodite. But if we were to name how many women are in Congress, how many women are senators? We never had a woman president, of course. Um, so if you look at that domain, or how many women are principals of colleges and universities, that is definitely we're in the minority. So I think, but women who've excelled in Aphrodite's world, they're definitely, mm -hmm. so it's, it's more like integration. That's why I would look at it. It's like integrating all aspects and not uh, leaving any behind or no unconscious. No parts of yourself undiscovered or un, un what, developed. I, and exactly. And I, sort of like, I, it's, I call it like the process of unearthing oneself. So it's all there. It's all there. And I think the goddesses is just another tool. It's like a tool. It's not the end in itself. Um, I think if, if anything, and in the heart of my book, it's really about that the goddess is really about the heart. Because when you have the heart alive, when the heart is awakened, when the flame is in, the, in your heart as a woman, then, then you really feel complete and whole. So that all this is very well as a way of exploration. But it's sometimes, you know, it's almost like when you're climbing up a ladder uh, and you, you have to get to the top, but then you don't need the ladder. You can throw it away. It's like, this is like a tool, or you need a rope to get up. But then you let go of the rope and the ladder because you've arrived. And I think, ultimately, having that heart of the goddess or the female spirit, the feminine spirit alive in us, then I think that is, to me, the most powerful tool for, uh, for anything. Well, we'll have to end on that, because this certainly is a celebration of women with all of your bringing the Greeks sort of full circle back yes. up at this point. So we wish you the best on the book. Thank you so and much. And all the things that you've shared with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having this me. This is Carol Spaulding with the Open Campus at Florida Community College. And we have Agape Stasinopoulos, who is going to produce this book and has shared a lot of things about the Greek gods. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Yasu. <laughs>